Good morning. Uh, my name is Joan. It's great to be back here at uh, Hyde Wesleyan. It has been, yes, 10 years <laughs> since we first actually stood up here in the podium. So it is great to be back and it's great to actually see familiar faces. And uh, Dan sends his greetings, as Pastor Bob had said, uh, he is also sharing at a, a different church uh, today. So it's my privilege to uh, share the stories with you today. Next slide. Um, I wanted to um, start off with um, the wonderful story of how Zimba Mission Hospital got started. It was back in the 1950s when Reverend Clarence and Roberta Keith were missionaries in um, the Tonga people in Zimba area. And Chief Sipatunyana, who was the chief of the tribe that they were ministering to at that time, approached them and said, I would want you to build a church, a school, and a hospital for my people. And so the missionary said, okay, well, we shall discuss it with our missions board. The missions board actually said, yes, you can do that. It's a good idea. The problem is we don't have any funds for it. So they, so they said, well, could we share it with the churches that we are going to be visiting while we are home on furlough? And they said, yes. So one Sunday evening, they were sharing at the church in Ohio, and they uh, shared about the request of the chief to the people there, and at the end of the service, somebody in the church approached them and said, here is a check for $10,000. Go build the church, the school, and the hospital for the Tonga people. So that is how Zimba Mission Hospital started. Since then, thousands of people have come to know Christ and accepted him as their Lord and Savior, and thousands more have continued to know the love of Christ for them individually since that time. Next slide. When we first uh, went to Zimba Mission Hospital uh, back in 2007, we saw a hospital that was really in very dire need. For many years, there had not been a, a permanent doctor there. Uh, it was about almost 50 years old, and the hospital was showing its age. There were no equipment in the hospital. There were no um, improvements in the facility. We did not have any medicines in the hospital. We did not even have enough staff during that time. So for Dan and I, it seemed to be mission impossible. But we just had to, stop to trust the Lord. We knew the Lord was there. It was his hospital after all. And we had already heard of the story of how this hospital was started. And because of um, partner churches like you are, individual donors, a total of about $750,000 have been raised for Zimba Mission Hospital these past few years. And for the last five years, 10 new buildings have been built at Zimba Mission Hospital. And if you've ever been to Africa, 10 new buildings in five years, that is unheard of. So the next slides are stories of what the Lord has been doing at Zimba Mission Hospital. Next slide. The first building that we had actually tackled was the chapel building. Before we had one small room in the hospital where we uh, gathered together every day, it sat about 25 people. Now we have a freestanding free chapel building that sits about 125 people comfortably. And every morning we gather here. There is also a chaplain's office as well as a bookstore that supports the chaplain's program. Next slide. We also have a new outpatient building. Before our outpatient, build, our outpatient department was housed half of what the maternity building was. We see about 75 to 120 people a day in our outpatient department. So now having this facility that was uh, completed in 2012, we are now in a much better facility. In this building, we have the HIV clinic, the TB clinic, the um, dental clinic, we have a four-bed emergency room, which is not really very common in Zambia. We also have the outpatient um, pharmacy, as well as a physiotherapy department. Next slide. The generator building was uh, completed in 2012. The national electric grid in Zambia is very poor. We have about from six to eight hours of power outages every day. So this really puts our patients in um, in a very dangerous situation. When I have patients in the ward that are on oxygen, when there's no power, there's no more oxygen. 
When there are babies in the incubator, there's no more, uh, there's no more heat given to them. Midwives, when they deliver at nighttime, there's no electricity, they have to bring out the, the candle and they deliver babies by candlelight. Patients that are being seen in the outpatient department that have traveled for days to go there, when there's no power, they don't have any x-rays, they don't have any labs, and they have to wait for hours or even days for them to get those, for those uh, tests that we need. So this generator building was really such a blessing for us. The generator was donated, by, was donated by Samaritan Spurs in Boone, North Carolina. And a group of electrician volunteers from ITEC, which is based in Montoursville, Pennsylvania, came to install this, um, this generator for us to use. And just like that, all of those challenges that we had before had lessened tremendously. Next slide. We also have a maternity a rehabilitation project that was actually one of the projects that we had pushed for when we were back uh, five years ago on furlough. Before, we only had one delivery bed. So when we actually have two ladies that are ready to deliver, it's like a race. <laughs> they will actually have to beat each other so that they get first dibs on this delivery bed. So now with our new maternity ward, we have five delivery beds. We have 12 postnatal beds. We even have a four neonatal ICU, which we never had before. Next slide. We have also built our chaplain his own chaplain's house. Without doubt, the chaplain has the most important job of anybody in the hospital. And to show our appreciation to him, we built him his own house. And what's nice about this house is that it is actually within the hospital campus. Before, when we needed him at nighttime, he had to ride his bicycle to come to the hospital. But now, we just knock on his door, and he comes and ministers to us and the patients as needed. Next slide. Because of the generosity of people, our initial maternity rehabilitation project actually raised about $130,000. And from that project, we actually were able to build a new antenatal ward. The women that come to deliver at Zimba Mission Hospital, they come from very far places. So when they develop complica complications during their pregnancies, it always becomes an emergency because they have to travel so far away. So with the new antenatal ward, we get to admit them and monitor them through their last stages of their pregnancy to make sure that mother and baby will have a good outcome at the end of that pregnancy. Next slide. And um, we have this um, storage building that we had built at Zimba Mission Hospital. And you might actually say, well, why would you have a storage building? We get a lot of 40-foot um, containers delivered at Zimba Mission Hospital that contains equipments and supplies. And we were kind of like wondering, well, how could we use these containers since it is just sitting in our yard, and uh, really it's hard to use those containers as storage because if you've ever been inside of that container when it is 100 degrees outside, it is very hot in there. So nobody would want to go into those containers. So we said, I'm sure we could actually do something with these containers. So what we did was that we used these containers as the building blocks. They are actually the walls of this very big storage container that we have now, and it is where we actually stage when we have equipments that come or when we have supplies that come, this is where we store all of those for the hospital. Next slide. And uh, for the past two years, we have been concentrating on our diagnostic center. So one of those buildings was the new radiology building. Before, our radiology as well as our lab department was actually in one small room. So now we have this freestanding uh, radiology building that houses the x-ray services, uh, ultrasound, EKG, as well as echocardiogram. Next slide. And inside of this radiology building is a new x-ray machine. Our x-ray machine was so old, it was probably about 30 years old, it really needed to retire. And so uh, our, one of our supporting churches in Williamsport, Pennsylvania said, well, we might be able to help you with that x-ray machine. So they had actually raised $40,000. And so we got a new x-ray machine for our new x-ray building. And the gentleman in this picture, his name is Bill Wright. 
He is actually a biomed engineer, so he graciously came and said, I can help you install that new x-ray machine. Next slide. And this is the new uh, um, lab building. This is the tenth of the um, last ones that we had built, and it was finished in March of this year. <laughs> Next slide. And you might actually say, oh, um, I was talking about the containers that come to Zimba Mission Hospital. And one of these containers was actually one from Beatrice, Nebraska. And the reason why I bring it up is because it was one of those stories that we just kind of like heard of. And uh, one of our visitors actually said to us, the hospital that I used to work in, in, in uh, Nebraska, is closing because they are building a new facility also within their town. And we are not going to be able to use the equipment as well as the furniture in this old hospital. Well, we could always sell them in eBay, but if you're going to be able to use them, you can come and gather them. And it just so happened that there was a gentleman in Nebraska who actually ships these containers to Zambia multiple times a year, and he says, well, if you could fill up a 40-foot container, I will send it to Zambia. And so that's what we did. We went to this old hospital, and everything in that hospital that was not in use, we took it to Zimba. And that was really how we were able to furnish our new outpatient building, as well as the new maternity um, uh, wards as well. Next slide. For the last several years, really for the last 10 years, Dan and I have only been the two doctors at Zimba Mission Hospital permanently. So it's always a joy when we have people come to share with the work with us. So the last four years, we had a total of about 150 volunteers that have come to join us in the work. Uh, some of them are nurses, some of them are uh, medical students, some of them are residents. And the gentlemen that are pictured here, the shorter gentleman is Dr. Woods, he is a, pro uh, he is a plastic surgeon, and the other gentleman is an anesthesiologist, and I will share with you their story as to how they had come to help us at Zimba Mission Hospital. Next slide. And you might actually wonder, well, all these crazy building projects that you have, what is that all about? In the movie Field of Dreams, there is a famous line there that says, if you build it, they will come. And that was really the intent. It is not about the buildings. It is always about the people. And we wanted the people to know Christ. And we wanted them to feel the love of Christ for each and every one of them. So the next couple of slides are actually individual stories of patients that have been impacted by the work at Zima Mission Hospital. Without the hospital there, they would have died. Our maternity improvement have really given such a big impact into how women get to deliver their babies at Zimba Mission Hospital. Before, when we had one bed, we only had about 500 deliveries a year. Now that we have really upgraded our hospital, we have more than tripled. Now we're up to about 1,500 deliveries in a day. And one of the stories that we want to share with you about the maternity project is that of Lister Camelenda. Lister suffers from epilepsy, so she has the seizure episodes. And when she was seven months pregnant, while she was cooking, she had a seizure episode and she fell into the fire. And she burned herself on her, um, on her lower legs. So when she was brought to Zimba Mission Hospital, she was deathly sick. Uh, infection had already set in and infection had been all over her body and we didn't really know whether she was going to survive. She was also seven months pregnant. So Dan took care of her doing daily wound care, morning and evening, making sure that the baby was doing well and growing. And it was actually during that time that the Lord providentially sent a plastic surgeon, Dr. Woods, as well as an anesthesiologist to Zimba Mission Hospital. So Dr. Woods did a skin grafting uh, on her legs, and Dr. Uh, Breath actually gave careful anesthesia so that the baby inside of her would not have a bad outcome. And so Lister actually stayed with us for about three months, and by the end of that stay, she was getting better, and she had actually done pretty well, and she also delivered a healthy baby boy. And Lister is actually one of Dan's favorite patients. Um, she gave Dan the honor of naming her child Dan. So Dan is, Big Dan is happy to report 
that now little Dan is a healthy, happy two-year-old child. Next slide. Um, you also have a neonatal intensive care unit, as I have mentioned. And neonatal intensive care units are not, um, are not available in Zambia. Well, I say neonatal intensive care unit, really, it really is just a room with, a, with an incubator. We don't have the bells and whistles in our neonatal intensive care, but it is an upgrade for us. And a story from that um, neonatal intensive care unit is that of um, Juliet. And Juliet was seven months pregnant when she delivered prematurely out in the bush, which was two hours away from us. So mother and child were transferred to us, and her baby was only 890 grams. That is one pound, 15 ounces. The baby was three months premature. So we put the baby inside the incubator, and the baby did pretty okay for about three weeks, until one day, the baby stopped to breathe. And so um, Dan had to put in a breathing machine, a, bre a breathing tube, inside the airway of this baby, so that the baby would be able to breathe. However, we don't have a respirator in Zimmer Mission Hospital. So what Dan did was that he actually taught Juliet to manually squeeze an ambu bag and manually breathe for her child. So she started at two o'clock in the morning, and when Dan did rounds the following day at around 10, 11 o'clock in the morning, he was surprised that baby Juliet was alive and kicking and pink. Apparently, Juliet and her family had taken turns throughout the night to squeeze this bag so that this child would actually breathe. And so Dan was able to extubate this child, and the baby stayed in the incubator for 70 days. And when the baby was two kgs, or four pounds and four ounces, the baby was discharged. And she's doing well up to today. Next slide. Oh, actually, um, do, could you go back to that other slide? Um, at the bottom of the slide, there is a baby with a Pumani bubble CPAP. That's one of the new gadgets that Dan has for his neonatal intensive care. As I've said, we don't have any, um, we don't have any respirators in Zambia. So um, Rice University in Texas actually developed a Pumani baby CPAP. And basically, what that one is, it will breathe for the child without having to have tubes down their throat. Respiratory failure is one of the most common reasons for why severely premature babies do not survive. So if we could actually put them in this Pumani CPAP for the first four days of their lives, they have equal chances of getting better and living fruitful lives, just like those babies that have all the bells and whistles that you guys have here in America. And Pumani is actually a Nanja word for to breathe. Next slide. Uh, Zambia has the second highest cervical cancer rate of any country in the world. During our first term, I usually get a lot of these women in my ward who get admitted for end-stage cervical cancer. And by then, there's really nothing that I could do. I give them pain medication, and that's it. So during our last term, we had a cervical, uh, prevention, cancer, uh, cervical cancer prevention program. And um, what we actually do is we use um, common household vinegar. So when we look at a woman's cervix and it looks normal, we apply the vinegar. And when it turns white, we do a biopsy because that means that there might be cancer cells in that cervix. And if there's cancer cells there, what we do is we either shave off the cancer cells if we can, or we do a hysterectomy. So uh, Brenda Mabingani is a lady that we first saw at our cancer cervical um, program. And uh, she did come and she actually had precancerous cells. She underwent a lip procedure. The next time we saw Brenda was about a year ago. She had come back to deliver at Zima Mission Hospital a healthy baby girl. Next slide. I often joke that I missed my husband because he seemed to be stuck in maternity. But unfortunately, there was still the rest of the hospital and OPD that needed to be taken care of, so I kind of stepped in. And the lady that is at the top picture is that of Juliet Kanana. Juliet is a very precious uh, patient to me. She is a patient that suffers from um, type 1 diabetes, 
meaning that she needs to have her insulin for her to survive. The thing about insulin is it needs to be refrigerated. It needs to be kept at a certain temperature. But Juliet, she lives about two, three hours away from the hospital, and there is no electricity in her village. So we are having a problem as to how to actually get her insulin cool. So what she does is she dug up a hole on the ground. She had put a clay pot in the ground. She puts water in the clay pot and that's how she stores her insulin. So sometimes she would come and her, insul and her glucose level is gonna be very high, and uh, she would stay in the hospital for two or three weeks while we get her insulin, uh, what we get her blood sugar levels under control. But one thing that is really interesting about uh, Juliet is that she does not really suffer from any complications of her diabetes. Sometimes she would complain of uh, numbness in her legs, but other than that, she's doing fine. The gentleman at the bottom picture is that of Vasco Ramuzzi. I first met Vasco when he was about 18, 19 years old, about five years ago. He suffers from liver cirrhosis, and basically liver cirrhosis is that your liver is not working. So what happened to Vasco is that he accumulates fluid in his belly. So when you get to see Vasco, it looks like he's 10 months pregnant because his belly is like, like this. So every month he comes to Zimba Mission Hospital and we do a procedure called paracentesis, wherein we put in a needle into his abdomen and we, train about, we drain about eight to 10 liters. That takes us about four hours when we do this procedure. But the thing about Vasco is he always has this big smile on his face and he always says after we're done, ah, thank you, doctor. I am good now. I will see you next month. <laughs> next slide. One of the reasons why we went to Zambia because we wanted to uh, take part in the fight against HIV AIDS. And so our HIV clinic has now really gotten very busy. We have a total of about more than 2,000 patients that are getting uh, antiretrovirals from our clinic and they are living very healthy, fruitful lives. And one of our stories that from that clinic is that of uh, Malindi Simango. We first met Malindi about um, six years ago in 2010. At that time, she was very frail. She was very sick. She could not even really stand up or walk. Her family had to do everything for her. We diagnosed her to have HIV, and at the same time, we also diagnosed her to have tuberculosis. And when you have HNV and tuberculosis at the same time, your chances of surviving is not very good. So I took care of Juliet, uh, of um, Malindi, and she stayed with us for about five weeks. We gave her medicine, she continued to improve, and she was able to go home. Since then, she comes back every three months in the HIV clinic and gets her medicines, and she's doing fine. Uh, the picture at the bottom is now Malindi. She is 125 pounds. She's very fit, and now she actually works in the hospital as a medical interpreter. She actually helps our, visiting, um, uh, our, our visitors with the language barrier, and she interprets Tonga in English and so that people can communicate. And she always says, you know, Zimba Mission Hospital is dear to me. It has not just given me back my health. It has also given me a ministry. Next slide. Uh, as much as we are very busy in the hospital, we also have three clinics that we have to go to. The clinics only has a nurse. There's actually no PAs or any doctors that are stationed in this clinic. Uh, we have three clinics, Yashitema, uh, Jembo, as well as Chaboboma, and Chaboboma is the furthest one that takes about four hours to travel. But it, patients and staff, they are always grateful when we come together with the dental clinic because we are offering them services that they would otherwise not have. Next slide. People are always asking us, why is it that you do what you do? And it's only because of one thing, and that is because of Christ. So every day we have a chapel service, Monday to Friday at eight o'clock in the morning. We never start anything at Zimba Mission Hospital without having Christ in our lives because we know we cannot do anything at Zimba Mission Hospital without him. Next slide. We also have the Jesus film in the chapel service. And if you know about the Jesus film, it is telling about Jesus' story in his own words in the heart language of the people that we are sharing it with. 
With us, it is in Chitonga. And it is still quite amazing to us that until now, people would come and say, Doctor, you never told us Jesus speaks Chitonga. <laughs> Next slide. And we also have our Bible distribution project. And basically, this is the Bible that is written in the heart language of the Tonga people. And they are always thankful for these Bibles because bookstores are not really available in Zambia. And so when we give them these books, it is like you have opened up a new world for them. And that is why this one is a very precious uh, program that we have. Next slide. We are back now in the U.S. for about a year. Um, we are doing our church talks. We have about 40 churches that support us. Um, this fall, we are planning on doing 20 churches. And then from middle November, December, January, we're planning on taking off for a rest and um, renewal. And hopefully um, by February, we will be able to do the rest of our church talks and go back to Zambia, maybe in June of next year. Next slide. I have shared with you stories of what is going on in Zimba Mission Hospital. It is our testimony that the Lord is there and he wants it to continue. It is also my testimony that the Lord has already given us the resources to continue his work. We don't really even have to look for it. He already has given us. And when we, you and I, as Christians, choose to live our faith in a very tangible way, the kingdom of God is proclaimed on earth as it is in heaven. For Dan and I personally, we would like to thank you. It has been our privilege to work on your behalf as medical missionaries at Zimba Mission Hospital. The work there is really not possible without your support. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Joan. You know, probably all of us have heroes in our life, people that we look up to and admire and, and uh, thank God that they're in our lives. And Dr. Dan and Dr. Joan are some of my heroes of people that I just really admire for the sacrifices that they have made and for the difference that they have made in the places that they have served. And um, we can be very proud of these ones that are a part of our missionary family that we support. And um, uh, maybe one day you'll be a part of a mission team going to Zumba Hospital, uh, as we've already had one team go, and uh, hopefully we'll have a chance of another time of going back to Zumba. Um, again, I hope that you will remember some of the things you've heard and that you will just uh, thank God for the privilege that we have to, to make a difference in Zambia, a place that is very, very needy with lots of, lot of health issues. And God has allowed us to, to be a big part of, of uh, reaching people through the health area in Zambia. We're going to stand and be dismissed in prayer, and I'm going to ask Joan if she would maybe go to the uh, lobby, and you could have a chance to say hello to her and um, thank her for what she's doing.